Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Case Notes podcast. Over the next few months, we're going to delve into the different physician branches or specialties. Just to start off with, what is a physician? Most people know what a GP is and what a surgeon is, but not everyone knows exactly what a physician does. Well, the formal description is specialists in internal medicine, so diseases and complaints that happen inside your body. And even if that sounds unfamiliar, you've almost certainly heard of a lot of the areas that this covers, like cardiology, diabetes, allergies, palliative care, infectious disease and neurology. These are all branches of medicine or specialties that physicians are responsible for. In each coming episode of Case Notes, we will pick one of these specialties and delve into its history, looking at its development over hundreds of years and some of the interesting stories and cases from the past. We'll also talk to a current physician working in that area to find out what it is like to be working as a specialist physician in the 21st century. Today we have a contributor joining us, Olivia Howarth, who's going to tell us about the history of this specialty. Cardiology is the branch of internal medicine that deals with diseases and abnormalities of the heart and some parts of the cardiovascular system. It encompasses diagnosis and treatment of congenital heart defects, coronary artery disease, heart failure, valvular heart disease and electrophysiology. The heart has played an important role in understanding the body since antiquity. Ancient Egyptians believed that the heart was the source of emotion and thought, that it recorded all of the good and bad deeds of a person's life and was needed for judgment in the afterlife. This is why it was left inside the body during mummification. The first recorded book on cardiology, The Treatise on the Heart, was one of the nine parts of the Ebers Papyrus dating to 1550 BCE. The Ebers Papyrus is the most extensive record of ancient Egyptian medicine and provides great insight into Egyptian anatomy generally, as well as the cardiovascular system specifically. It contains many incantations meant to turn away disease-causing demons, but it also provides evidence of empirical practice and observation. Clinical scenarios detail a variety of issues that could affect the heart. The heart was supposedly deflected when heat from the anus caused it to enlarge and shift towards the stomach. It was spread out when its vessels carried feces, and it was flexed or shrunken when Rakedu fell upon it, Rakedu being the name of a poisonous substance in the lower intestines believed to cause disease. In ancient Egyptian medicine, the heart is described as being the central organ in a system of vessels supplying the body. This cardiocentric belief was perpetuated with the ancient Greeks, who also believed the heart to be the seat of intelligence. In the 4th century BCE, the Greek philosopher Aristotle identified the heart as the most important organ of the body, the first to form according to his observation of chick embryos. Based on his experience with animal dissection, Aristotle surmised that as certain animals could move and feel without the brain, the brain could not be responsible for movement or feeling. Instead, he believed the heart was a three-chambered organ composed of sinews that allowed the body to move. It has been suggested that although the cardiocentric hypothesis was eventually proven incorrect, the emphasis on the importance of the heart in antiquity helped contribute to the discovery of the cardiovascular system. Arguably, the history of cardiology begins with the discovery of circulation. For a long time, it was thought that the English physician William Harvey was the pioneer of this idea in his great work Exercitatio Anatomica de Mortu Cordis et Sanguinis in Animabilis, otherwise known as de Mortu Cordis. Published in Frankfurt in 1628, this book is a landmark in the history of cardiology and physiology more widely, as Harvey used his own empirical evidence to demonstrate the circulation of blood. He observed that with each beat, two ounces of blood left the heart, so that with 72 heartbeats per minute, the heart introduces 540 pounds of blood every hour into the system. Prior to Harvey's work, physicians had relied on the teachers of ancient Greek physician Galen, 
who claimed that the blood was created by the liver and then consumed by living tissue. He disproved this theory, showing that the quantity and velocity of blood in the human body made it physically impossible for blood to do anything other than return to the heart by way of veins. However, Harvey was not the first to describe pulmonary circulation. Ibn al-Nafis was a 13th century Arab physician and polymath who studied medicine in Damascus before moving to Egypt where he became chief physician at al-Naziri hospital. Like Harvey, he also explained the construction of the heart, and in his book Commentary on the Anatomy of the Canon of Avicenna, he accurately described the flow of blood between the right side and the left side of the heart through the lungs. Although his description of pulmonary circulation was written over 300 years before his European colleagues made the same discovery, Ibn al-Nafis' work was forgotten until the 20th century, when it was uncovered in the Prussian State Library in Berlin. Nevertheless, by the end of the 17th century, anatomical knowledge of the heart was remarkably accurate, and Harvey's ideas were widely accepted. It was arguably the 18th century that saw the beginning of clinical cardiology. In 1749, the first textbook on heart disease was published by Jean-Baptiste de Senac, physician to King Louis XV. The result of years of anatomical and physiological study, Traité de la structure du corps, de son action et de ses maladies, contained much therapeutic advice. Senac described several heart disorders, including aortic regurgitation, mitral calcification, and mitral regurgitation. He advised opiate and venesection for acute pulmonary edema, rest for heart failure, and quinine for disorders of rhythm. At this time, clinical cardiology was based on pulse examination and auscultation, the technique of placing the ear directly on the patient's chest whereas diagnosis of heart diseases was performed in post-mortem examination. Sinak's treatise is impressive because it reveals much about the anatomy of the heart in cardiac disease before the development of such diagnostic techniques as percussion of the chest and immediate auscultation. Percussion for examination of the chest was first described in 1754 by the Austrian physician Joseph Leopold Auenbrugger. Tradition has it that Auenbrugger as an innkeeper's son, learned about percussion by watching his father tap on wine barrels in his cellar to determine how full they were. He discovered that tapping his fingers on the patient's chest produced sounds of varying pitch depending on what structure was underneath, and that the note was dull over the heart. Auenbrugger largely described his chest percussion technique as a method of diagnosis for lung conditions. However, his book, Inventum Novum Ex Percussioni Thoracis Humani, published in 1761, also mentions dropsy of the pericardium and aneurysm of the heart, with both causing a deadened percussion sound, like striking a fleshy limb. Unfortunately, percussion attracted little attention from the medical community until the publication of Mediate Auscultation by René Theophile Hyacinth Lenec in 1819. In this work, Lenek describes his invention of the stethoscope, which revolutionised the study of diseases of the thoracic organs. He was the first to note that there are two successive sounds to each heartbeat, the first dull and longer, the second shrill and shorter. He compared the second sound to the sound made by a dog lapping up water. He also described different varieties of heart murmur, the bruit de soufflette, which sounded like the noise produced by a pair of bellows, was attributed to over-distension of the heart with blood. The bruit de lime, bruit de scie, and bruit de rapé, simulating the noise made by filing, soaring, and rasping, which he thought due to stenosis of one of the cardiac orifices. Thirdly, there was the musical or hissing sound audible only over the arteries. The next stethoscope received much attention, and physicians from all over the world came to Paris to learn from the master. Auscultation with the stethoscope became an integral component of physical examination worldwide, and became the primary component in cardiology. This was partly due to the high incidence of rheumatic valvular diseases at the time, which media auscultation proved unparalleled in diagnosing. 
During the 18th and 19th centuries, physicians acquired a deeper understanding of pulse, blood pressure, heart sounds and murmurs, respiration and exchange of blood gases in the lungs, of heart muscle structure and function, of congenital heart defects, and of irregular heart rhythms. But it was during the 20th century that extraordinary progress in cardiology was made possible by improved diagnostic tools and processes. Radiological evaluation of the heart grew out of German physicist Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen's experiments with X-rays in 1895. Electrocardiography, the measurement of electrical activity in the heart, evolved from research by Dutch physiologist Willem Enthoven in 1903, and cardiac catheterization, invented in 1929 by German surgeon Werner Forsman and refined soon after by American physiologists Andre Cornand and Dickinson Richards, provided important information about the structure and function of the heart, allowing physicians to study normal and abnormal electrical activity. Perhaps the most profound and wide-reaching diagnostic technique developed in the past century was the echocardiogram. Following an increasing interest in the use of medical ultrasonics, Swedish physician Inga Edler, in collaboration with the physicist Karl Helmuth Hertz, developed echocardiology, a process in which ultrasound waves are directed through the chest wall in order to generate images of the heart. Initially intended for the preoperative study of mitral stenosis and diagnosis of mitral regurgitation, Edler and Helmer's work on a new, non-invasive diagnostic technique was carried forward by cardiologists all over the world to enable appropriate referrals for surgery and treatment. So today we're talking about cardiology and we have Dr. Omar Furzia here. So welcome. I wondered if we could start off by you just saying a little bit about yourself, you know, where you work and, and what you do. Yeah, thank you, Daisy, for, the, for inviting me. Um, so, yeah, my name is uh, Omar Fezia. I'm a, a consultant cardiologist in Fort Valley Royal Hospital. Um, I graduated uh, with an MBCHB degree from the University of Dundee in 2007. Uh, I did my uh, core medical training in Dundee before moving to Edinburgh and training cardiology in Edinburgh uh, and finishing my training in 2019. Uh, I worked as a consultant cardiologist in Dunfee St. Galloway for a year initially before moving to NHS Fort Valley, where I'm a consultant cardiologist and a cardiac devices lead in NHS Fort Valley. Uh, but I'm also a foundation program director. Uh, I have a keen interest in medical education and research. I have a master's degree in cardiology, postgraduate master's degree in cardiology um, in medical education. Um, and uh, I run uh, regular training sessions uh, for nursing staff, for cardiology uh, trainees, but also for foundation uh, doctors in medicine. That's me in a nutshell. So if we could just start with the absolute basics. So could you just explain to us what cardiology is, in your opinion? Yeah, um, the definition of cardiology is a bit blurred at the moment because we moved into multiple other specialties where we're doing more surgical procedures and doing more radiological procedures. But if you go back to the basics, cardiology is a, a discipline within medicine that deals with the heart and disorders of the cardiovascular system. Um, and within that, we have multiple subspecialties, almost like branches of the heart and the cardiovascular system. Uh, and these are, for instance, coronary heart disease. These are people with angina and heart attacks, where the cardiologists deal with those patients. To patients with heart failure, these are people with impaired function of the heart or pump function failure. To patients with disorders of the rhythm of the heart, uh, people with irregular heartbeat and palpitations. And also people with um, the cardiomyopathy, which is a muscle disorder of the heart, for instance. So all of these multidisciplinary, um, you know, specialties within cardiology are the day-to-day -day function of a cardiologist, and they define what cardiology is nowadays. 
Thank you very much. So that's what cardiology is. I'm interested to find out about what cardiology isn't. So whether we're talking about your patients, the, the public, you know, some of your peers or colleagues, are there any stereotypes that people have about cardiologists or are, are there any misconceptions yeah. about the work that you do? Yes, yeah, interesting. Um, I think the biggest misconception is that all cardiologists are interventionists or interventional cardiologists. And um, we face this quite a lot in our clinics and our patient clinics where the patients in a way expect you to be an interventional cardiologist to be doing coronary angiography and coronary angioplasty. These are procedures we do to open up the blocked arteries and put stents within the heart. In reality, that's only a minority of cardiologists do that. It's only one subspecialty out of six or seven subspecialties of cardiology. So not most, you know, most cardiologists don't do that. Most cardiologists refer patients to, you know, interventional cardiologists to do this type of procedures. For instance, my subspecialty is um, cardiac devices. So I implant pacemakers and um, defibrillators and special devices to support the function of the heart called cardiac synchronization therapy. I also subspecialize in advanced cardiovascular imaging. Uh, so this is CT and MRI and echocardiography to, to, image, to image the heart. But I don't subspecialize in, you know, for instance, coronary intervention or electrophysiology uh, or even heart failure, which is another subspecialty of cardiology. So I think the big misconception is a lot of people think that cardiologists can do everything within cardiology, but in fact, most of us only focus on a small area of cardiology and specialize in that area and develop special expertise in that particular field. So the, the next question I'm going to ask is probably a bit of a horrible one, given everything that you said about the range of things that you do. Is it possible for us to hear about, you know, a typical day in the life of your work, or is it just not that simple? Is there no typical day for you? That's true that there isn't a typical day um, in the line of work of a cardiologist. So what I would be doing um, on a daily basis would be completely different to my colleague. So um, for instance, as I said, um, I specialize in device implantation. So I might spend, you know, the morning in theater, implanting cardiac devices to support the heart and make the heart pump better and you know the speed of the heart would be back to normal. Uh, on the other hand, my colleague who specializes in cardiac imaging would be spending the morning doing CT or doing cardiac MRI, looking at the function of the heart using you know radiological means. In the afternoon, I'll probably be doing a clinic, uh, seeing uh, patients who present with different you know cardiac symptoms. Um, uh, another colleague of mine might be doing a ward round looking after the inpatients. Uh, uh, and again, you know, the, if you look at other hospitals, there might be other people doing coronary intervention at that particular time. So I think there's a variable, uh, you know, um, duties for cardiologists to do on a daily basis. And, you know, as a, as a cardiology trainees, you tend to choose your subspecialty earlier on so that it would be something you're going to be doing most of the time. You know, as a as a consultant um, for the rest of your career, really. Thank you very much. So you you've talked already about you know the various different roles, different places that you've worked. But I'm interested to know how did you get there? You know, at what point did you decide of all the specialties that cardiology was the one that you were going to sort of focus your career on? Yeah, um, I never thought of cardiology as a as a main career for me. I have to say, until until I was an FI one, I've always wanted to do surgery um, or probably interventional radiology. I always liked anatomy. I liked physiology. As a medical student in Dundee, um, I did all my research in cardiac surgery as a as a student, really. Um, but so I've always wanted to do cardiac surgery, for instance, and radiology was probably another interest of mine, interventional radiology, for instance. But as, a, as an FI1, I remember that very well. My first job as an FI1 was cardiology in Nine Wells Hospital. Yeah. And um, my supervisor at that time, the consultant I worked with, uh, was Dr. Graham McNeil, who probably was one of the best consultants I've worked with uh, throughout my career. Um, he was very approachable, very empathetic. Um, he led the team from within, 
very approachable to all of us. Um, he made us feel part of the team, his patient um, treatment and how the way he made patients feel comfortable and uh, empowered in their decision making was exemplary. Uh, and I have to say that myself and a lot of my team members really enjoyed working with him. And sometimes when you enjoy working with someone, he made you love that specialty. And I think he is the reason I loved cardiology because after that four months of cardiology as an FY1, I knew that I wanted to be like him. I wanted to imitate him. I don't think I've ever told him that. and um, Probably I should have. Um, uh, but he really is one of those consultants who made a, an everlasting change, not just in me and a lot of my colleagues, because we loved the way he dealt with his patients. And, and he was one of those cardiologists who loves doing procedures for his patients as well. So he used to do the angiograms and the pacemakers for his patients. And I felt that cardiology kind of filled that you know, desire in myself in doing surgery because it's one of only few medical specialties where you do a lot of procedures. And at the same time, you do lots of radiological procedures. So you do CT scans and MRI and echocardiograms. So, so for me, I felt that cardiology you know, fills the best of both worlds, surgery, radiology, but also you have the old model of a consultant that does all of that and deals with patients in a nice way where the patients are at the center of, of, um, of the care. Uh, and since then, that was me focusing on cardiology till um, till uh, till I managed to be successful in, in training cardiology. So yeah, it took one man to you know change my mind. Fantastic, thank you. So I'm also interested to know over your career so far, have there been any particularly interesting cases or? disease types i mean obviously we don't want to get into anything that's going to be a breach of data protection but has there has been has there been anything in terms of the treatment side of things that has really stuck with you as as something that's impacted on you um obviously there's been there's been a lot of developments in cardiology a lot of technological advances in cardiology um i think probably the main thing that stuck with me is how patients present with the same disease, but with different symptoms. Um, and I, uh, as a as a specialist in in heart rhythm disorder, and, and uh, you know, I specialize in cardiac devices. I implant them for people with slow heartbeat and abnormal heartbeats, for instance, or poor cardiac function. You always think that you know all the symptoms that patients present with. Um, but I had the humbling experience to know that a colleague of mine who shared an office with me for, you know, three, four years had a problem with a heart rhythm disorder. And, you know, he's a cardiologist and I'm a cardiologist. And none of us managed to diagnose or even know the problem until the end. So it tells you that it almost gave me a dose of reality to, to know that you don't know everything. And um, sometimes things that seems quite simple and easy are not, and patients as human beings don't present with the same symptoms. We're not dealing with, you know, a fixed, you know, what we call physics as opposed to, um, uh, you know, something unfixed. We're, we're dealing with human beings. The human beings are different. Are, um, there's a lot of subject, subjective element to their, to their symptoms, and some of them don't complain. Um, and obviously, my colleague ended up requiring a pacemaker at the end, and it was it was me who implanted it in him. So uh, I do remember that very well. It's an experience that will stick with me. Uh, he's doing extremely well now. But um, uh, in a way, it, it makes me appreciate what patients say and listen to them carefully. And instead of uh, putting what they say in little boxes that fits with my way of thinking, I always think outside the box and listen to them carefully and uh, uh, and try and deal with their symptoms uh, in a way that, you know, helps them as opposed to just disregard the symptoms. So my colleague in the pacemaker has never had blackouts, has never had shortness of breath, um, has never had the usual symptoms that you expect from someone who needs a pacemaker. Uh, but part of that is because he also downplayed a lot of his symptoms and, and in a way it took us longer 
to get to the bottom of his problem um, as opposed to the routine patients that we see in our clinics. So the learning experience for me is that I should always listen to my patients and um, don't downplay the symptoms. So you've talked before about how cardiology is changing, how it's branching out more. So I'm interested to know, over the course of your career, you know, how has cardiology as a specialty changed and developed? Yeah, um, uh, it is changing quite a lot. Um, I think the, the boundaries between cardiology as a medical specialty and, for example, surgery or radiology is very blurred now. Um, nowadays, CT scan, CT coronary angiogram and cardiac MRI are almost the norm. Certainly in Fort Valley, you're quite lucky to have a CT coronary angiogram service and cardiac MRI service. And these are specialties that in the past, they are part of the radiologists, you know, armor, really. They are radiologist domain. Now the cardiologists are the main uh, people doing them. Um, they get, you know, collaborative work with the radiologists, but it's mainly a cardiology subspecialty. Right? Um, so we moved from echocardiogram as the main imaging modality for cardiology to multimodality imaging techniques with CT and MRI. And it's the same thing for surgery. Um, if you think about the procedures that we do, uh, you know, certainly five, six years ago, we weren't doing as many as now. Nowadays, you know, valve intervention are done by cardiologists as opposed to the surgeons. Minimal valve, minimally invasive procedures are being done by cardiologists as well. And even special devices implantation. Um, in fact, I was, I was in a course today uh, learning about implanting subcutaneous defibrillators. These are special defibrillators that we implant under the skin uh, with, you know, wires under the skin as opposed to within the vein. And the people training us today were cardiac surgeons. Um, they were the one who really adopted the techniques initially, and now they're passing it to the cardiologists to do. Uh, and that's only one example of many procedures that have been passed by the surgeons and the cardiologists to do. Uh, and that's, in a way, the beauty of cardiology. Um, it, it doesn't doesn't stay still. It always moves into the surgical specialties, into radiology, into a bit more advanced, you know, techniques. But also, the beauty of it is also is the research. So everything that we do is evidence based. It's probably one of the only specialties within medicine and surgery that has more research than anything else. Uh, you know, every year there's a new guideline because of a new research or new data had come up and the guideline has to change. And you need to be up to date with all of that. Um, so if you look at the evidence-based practice that we used to do 10 years ago, it's probably completely changed now. Um, and that's part of you know, the, the, the change, the positive development and evolution of cardiology. Um, and if I, even if I go back to devices, you know, implantable pacemakers, they've been around for 50, 60 years. The ones that we used to implant 56 years ago are completely different from the one that we implant now. Um, certainly my colleagues used to implant pacemakers 10 years ago. Uh, the ones that we implant now without, for example, without leads, without wires, um, or um, the ones that are, um, are specific to the conduction system within the heart, they didn't exist 10 years ago. So you need to be always up to date. You need to develop your own skills, you never stay still. You always go to conferences and courses to develop your own skills and, in a way, present the best practice to your patients. Um, and again, in NHS Fort Valley, we do all of that. We're quite lucky that we have a very innovative cardiology department. We use the new technologies in, in our practice, uh, whether it's you know cardiac imaging or devices implantation, heart failure, uh, but also we bring the whole team with us. So we know that cardiology is not is not run by cardiology consultants only. Uh, they're only a small part of a big team of cardiology nurses and radiographers and physiologists and trainees uh, and managers. Uh, and all of them as a team, you move forward. You always try to bring the best you can do to your patients, really, and um, give them uh, the best evidence practice that you can do. So... Um... Imagining for a moment that I am allowed to open a museum of medicine and I have one tool or object representing each specialty, what would you put into this museum as an object that represents the work that you do? Well, I think I'll be biased here. Uh, 
and I'd put a peacemaker. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think there are many things that you can you can put in the museum when it comes to cardiology, and uh, my interventional colleagues might start thinking about different stents or different um, valve prostheses. But I think from from my point of view, and certainly from the devices aspect, uh, probably even not from the devices aspect, point of view, but when you think about the history of cardiology, and you think that you know just only 60, 70 years ago, people used to die from heart block when the conduction within the heart has stopped working properly and people you know would die and would you know just accept that as you know the natural thing that happened at that time to now being treated with a pacemaker and being able to go back to the normal life normal sports normal activities as if nothing happened without uh, without any symptoms that's a significant advance in, in cardiology over a very short period of time. We're talking about 50 to 60 years. You know, the first pacemakers in the 50s were, you know, the size of a microwave that you have to push around, you know, with wires coming through your chest to now having a procedure done, you know, as a day case, small device under the skin. You go home the same day, having a normal life expectancy, no symptoms whatsoever. That's a huge turn of events for cardiology. And for me, that's probably the most significant thing that ever happened to cardiology. Um, and it's still, still moving forward in 20, 30 years' time. This might be an old-fashioned way of dealing with heart rhythm disorder, new things, new devices that you can just plug within the heart and takes over the conduction of the heart would be the norm. So um, for me, probably the first pacemaker that was implanted you know, in the 50s um, would be the one I would put in the museum. That's uh, full of thinking, you know, by the, the surgeons at that time uh, to treat something that nowadays we'll consider easily treatable. You, you, you've won me over with your argument. We'll definitely put the pace. Once I can persuade people to fund this museum, we'll definitely put the pacemaker in it. So you've, you've touched on, you know, the possibility that pacemakers you know, as you say, will themselves end up looking old fashioned at some point as things develop. So yeah. I was wondering if you had any other thoughts on where you see cardiology going. You know, are there any changes that you think are on the horizon in 10, 20 or, or more years time? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think that there's a lot of changes, you know, even even after COVID now, um, or since COVID, for instance, there's been a lot of developments in cardiology, uh, particularly the use of technology. So we, we see a lot of smartwatches these days that diagnose, you know, heart rhythm disorder. We see lots of health apps and heart, um, uh, you know, health apps as well uh, that people use, ECG monitors that people use at home. Um, so the days of people needing to be investigated by a cardiologist um, are well, almost all gone, really. These days, patients come with, investigations they've done themselves whether it's right or wrong it's something that we need to adapt and and work with and, and try and you know make the best out of it so the use of you know self-directed investigation is going to be the, the norm in the future uh, the use of uh, technologies to treat patients or even you know diagnose patients and communicate with patients from the comfort of their home would be the norm so before covid Remote clinics and virtual clinics uh, didn't really exist. Nowadays, this is the norm. You know, clinics via uh, video conferences and uh, via telephone, for instance, is the norm these days. And the patients accept that, and um, and some of them like that quite a lot. Um, we have patients from remote areas in Fort Valley. Same thing in the Fisin Gallery, where patients are from different areas. And being able to communicate with them from the comfort of their homes without them driving, you know, for two hours to come to a clinic to see you is something that we should have thought about a long time ago. Um, but uh, it's the legacy of the COVID-related change to our practice now. And I'm sure it will change even further in the future with the use of technologies and, uh, and so on. But yeah, but the, the way we deliver our services will definitely change uh, this time. 
Thank you very much. So sort of sticking, I suppose, with the future for the moment, um, you know, the, the next generation of doctors are, you know, the key part of that future. And I was just thinking, you know, there, there may be people listening to this podcast who are at university studying medicine, who are thinking about how to specialise or, or who are thinking about going to university to study medicine. So is there any advice that you would give to this next generation of doctors? And why should they pick cardiology rather than any other specialty? <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> well, I hope that they have um, a really good consultants that can take them under their wings and obviously, you know, show them how to look after the patients and, um, you know, make them want cardiology or love cardiology. And that that's a starting point. I think being mentors for the future is, is the main thing. Um, but what I can say is that cardiology offers variety of um, interests uh, for the trainees, um, but also for the consultants in the future. So it's not it's not just one discipline, which we call cardiology, but it's multiple disciplines that all fits in within cardiology. Uh, so if they want, if they uh, if they are interested in surgical procedures, there's always intervention and cardiac devices. If they are interested in uh, radiological procedures, there's always CT and cardiac MRI and echocardiogram, for instance. Um, if they're more interested in um, diagnosing um, heart failure and cardiomyopathies, for instance, and inherited cardiac conditions and congenital heart disease, this all exists within cardiology. And within all of the cardiology subspecialties, you have that communication within the team. You have cardiology nurses, you have physiologists, you have multidisciplinary approach to, to patient care. So you always feel supported if you're part of the team. Um, and you feel that things are always evolving within cardiology. So, you know, in the old days where, you know, cardiologists were done by a consultant, for instance, in the clinic, seeing patients is it's changed completely. Now you have nurses running clinics, cardiology nurses, nurse-led clinics, for instance. So that interaction with other specialties, the, you know, the, the transfer of experience is always there. Um, and I always find that, fascinating and found it very helpful. I always felt that I'm part of part of a team. Most importantly, what I want to tell the trainees or the students is the misconception that cardiology doesn't offer that work-life balance because cardiology is always busy, they're on call. Um, you know, it's always kind of work that comes first when it comes to cardiology. That's not true. In fact, um, I quite love cardiology for that reason. I have really good work-life balance. Um, I drop my kids to school, pick them up from school every day, um, spend, you know, the nights with them, uh, spend the weekends, most of the weekends with them. So it's the same as any other medical specialty. Uh, but there's another subspecialties within cardiology where, in fact, you don't have to be doing a lot of you know, out of hours procedures like coronary angioplasty, coronary angiography, you can do heart failure, you can do devices, you can do multiple other subspecialties if, uh, you know, the out of hours uh, intervention is not for you. So what I, want to, what I want to tell the trainees is don't think of it as a, a negative impact on your life balance. It can give you good work-life balance. It can give you a lot of satisfaction, uh, whatever your interests are, whether it's surgery or medicine or um, radiology, uh, cardiology covers all of that, which is unique, uh, you know, when you think about all the other specialties. Um, and um, it's one of those specialties as well in cardiology where there's a good mix, you know, from, you know, females and males joining cardiology, people from different, you know, ethnicity and different backgrounds joining cardiology. So it's very open to everyone, really. Probably unreasonable question to ask you, given everything that you said, because I'm interested to know what are the particular skills that you need as a cardiologist? But it may be, again, with the range of things people do, there are no particular skills. But what what, what makes a good cardiologist, would you say? Um, yeah, um, going back to the basics, at the end of the day, cardiology is a, a medical discipline, is a discipline of medicine. And really what makes medicine uh, what it is, is having a good communication skills. So being empathetic to your patients, listening to them, listening skills are crucial. Um, and um, 
showing respect uh, and sympathy uh, and just being helpful uh, is the main skills of cardiology, just the same as any other specialty in medicine. But also because cardiology deals with other team members, cardiology is always part of a big team. Um, so having that you know, team player and team leader kind of uh, skills is useful, being approachable and um, and also being motivated and ambitious to change things. Because cardiology is always changing. It's not static uh, at all. If I remember, you know, when I was in Nine Walls Hospital in 2007, when we used to thrombolize patients, give them a drug to, you know, get rid of the clot uh, from when they have a heart attack, to now when they're doing angiograms and putting stents, things have evolved massively within, you know, 10 years in, in Nine Walls Hospital, for instance. It's the same thing. Um, in NHS Fort Valley, where we used to send our patients to Edinburgh for pacemakers and cardiac devices, to now being able to do all of them locally, things have moved significantly. So having that ambitious and motivated uh, inner personality is always uh, helpful in cardiology, because cardiology is always moving forward, it never, never stays the same. This has been really fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us, Omar. Likewise. Um, Thank you so much, Daisy, for inviting me. For this week's case study, we'll be looking into the case of Sir James Mackenzie and why he became known as the father of British cardiology. James Mackenzie was born April 12th, 1853, in Scone, Perthshire. He left school aged 14 and was apprenticed to a chemist before he went on to study medicine. He passed his entrance exam for the University of Edinburgh in 1874 and remained in Edinburgh for his residency following graduation. Following this, he set up as a general practitioner in Burnley, Lancashire. Although engaged in a busy practice, Mackenzie continued to be a prolific researcher, recognising the importance of understanding the prognostic significance of symptoms and signs that he came across in his everyday work. He made many original observations and had many papers published, completing his MD degree on hemiparaplegia spinalis in 1882. During this period, he corresponded and discussed his findings with other well-known physicians. These included William Osler, a Canadian physician and one of the four founding professors of Johns Hopkins Hospital, and Carol Frederick Venkerback, a cardiologist and professor of medicine in the University of Groningen. Mackenzie's ongoing investigations led him to leave general practice and become a specialist cardiologist himself. Mackenzie was a key figure in shaping British cardiology. His main interests were in cardiac failure in pregnant women and cardiovascular disease more generally. Arguably, Mackenzie's most notable achievement was in bringing objectivity and measurement to the understanding of cardiac irregularities. Specifically, he made pulsation recordings to aid in heartbeat analysis. Initially, these recordings were made using a modified Dutchen sphygmograph. This was a device which was strapped to the patient's wrist, where the pulse caused a metal strip to move a stylus, which transmitted a record of the pulse onto smoked paper. Later, in 1906, Mackenzie went on to invent the multi-channel ink writing polygraph with the help of a Lancashire watchmaker, Sebastian Shaw. In their model, a tambour, or rubber diaphragm, was placed over a vein in the neck, whilst another one was placed on the arterial pulse in the wrist. The movement of these vessels vibrated the diaphragms, transmitting waves through rubber tubing to two recording arms, which recorded venous and arterial pulsations simultaneously as continuous lines on paper. He used this device, the Mackenzie polygraph, to detect cardiac arrhythmias, which inadvertently laid the basis for the modern-day lie detector or polygraph test. After 28 years of single-handed painstaking observations and recordings, Mackenzie published The Study of the Pulse, Arterial, Venous and Hepatic, and of the Movements of the Heart in 1902. This book was pivotal in the development of cardiology, as it was the first scientific treatise on irregularities of the pulse, 
and it established Mackenzie's reputation as one of the leading heart specialists of his time. He later brought together his study of polygraph recordings with electrocardiogram tracings, using a combination of physical examination, detailed patient histories and heart sounds to deliver prognoses. Mackenzie also demonstrated the efficacy of digitalis, a drug prepared from the dried leaves of foxgloves, in the treatment of arrhythmias, and made important contributions to the study of the energetics of the heart muscle. In November 1907, Mackenzie left Burnley for London and set up as a consulting physician where his reputation grew rapidly. In 1913, he was appointed physician in charge of the first cardiac department in the UK at the London Hospital, and by 1915, he was elected as a Fellow of the Royal Society and was knighted. Sadly, if rather ironically, Mackenzie himself suffered from an irregular heartbeat as a result of ischemic heart disease. However, even in this, he was diligent at recording his symptoms in history. He had his first heart attack in 1901 and recorded his own atrial fibrillation during this episode. He was also Case 28 in his own book, Angina Pectoris, published in 1923. He died shortly after developing severe cardiac pain whilst at a Burns supper in London in 1925, and in accordance with his wishes, his heart was removed by his assistant John Parkinson. Parkinson then sent the heart to David Waterston, Professor of Anatomy at St Andrews, who with the help of D.F. Kappel, Professor of Pathology in Dundee, wrote up the pathological description in the British Heart Journal in 1939. This revealed that Mackenzie had extensive coronary artery disease and evidence of recent and old myocardial infarction. Sir James Mackenzie was a pioneer in the study of cardiac arrhythmias and cardiovascular dysfunction, and a master in the art of clinical observation, no doubt deserving of his title as the father of British cardiology. Thank you for listening to this Case Notes podcast. If you'd like to find out more about the work we do, you can visit our website at rcpe.ac.uk forward slash heritage. You can also find us on Twitter at RCPE Heritage. And we have a Just Giving page, RCPE Heritage, linked to on our website if you'd like to support our work and help to fund future podcasts. Thank you.